meeting to order. Um, first up this evening, we need an approval of the agenda, please. I move that we approve the agenda as presented. Second. Okay. Joe and Mark with the motions. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Motion carries. We have a couple of visitors joining us tonight uh, via Zoom. Um, we want to welcome them. Uh, we also want to welcome those who might be following along at home uh, through the feed. Um, great to have you this evening. We are going to turn uh, the floor over to start uh, to Karis Grostadier, uh, who is uh, requested to uh, address the board this evening. So with that, Karis, I will turn it over to you. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Hi everybody, members of the board and others in attendance. Um, I'm Karis Grostadier. I'm a parent of two EHS student athletes and a nurse practitioner in the Casey area ICU. Um, in addition to my regular job, I've worked in a COVID ICU for three months of 2020 as relocated staff, as well as a substitute teacher for Morgan Hunter. And I really appreciate the chance to speak tonight. I'm aware that some of the issues I will be addressing can also be brought up with the health department or the State Department of Education. However, to the extent that these things may be under your control, I'd like to discuss a few here tonight. First, thank you so much for addressing issues around immunity before the vaccine rollout in the Navigating Change document. Also, now that the school has the ability to test students, the information that is gathered from that testing will help questions around immunity as well. Regarding the new immunity guidelines in the document, it states, quote, if I have had an antibody test and it shows that I have SARS antibodies and I am a close contact, do I need to isolate slash quarantine? Answer, no, end quote. However, the rest of the answer states, quote, antibody tests at this point in time are not considered reliable markers of previous infection. There is nothing in state guidance about antibodies and quarantine at this time, end quote. So I've, quite the question there is, will the school require quarantine or not in that case? Um, I'd like to submit that multiple studies since November 2020, as well as a brand new study that the CDC published on January 6th, indicates that asymptomatic patients and those who experience a mild COVID-19 case still show an immune response eight months later. It appears to me that research disagrees with the statement that antibody tests are not considered reliable. Antibodies are markers of current infection, which is called IgM, um, or immunity due to a previous infection, which is IgG. Even if decisions can't be made using this information now, please keep the finding studies in mind for the development of future guidelines. Um, if you've ever been infected, especially if you're positive for COVID IgM, these studies, or IgG, I'm sorry, uh, these studies and the physiology of immunity suggest that quarantine for close contact contact doesn't make sense. Second, depending on the upcoming CASIA decision, is there a plan for a four tickets per participant option for winter sports? This is what CASIA has on their agenda to discuss. Um, I'd like to express advocacy for this plan or at least a two ticket option as there are times when parents can't come or just don't come. My senior was so downhearted to think that the last time he went to a home basketball game last year was his last time ever. I know that these student athletes, while so grateful to have parents present, would love a physically distanced student section. Third, what are the district's plans with assisting staff to receive the vaccine? Once both vaccines are administered to staff, will the masking requirements be lifted? Projected herd immunity is June or July of 2021 after vaccines are made available to the general public. I know it's early to think about August 2021 but fortune favors the well-prepared, and I think parents and students would like a plan for unmasking when the time is right. Fourth, I appreciate the modified in-person schedules for all schools. I'll continue to advocate for as much in-person school as possible to improve grades, bolster mental health, and for many at-risk children that need teachers and staff watching out for them. In-person school, especially for young students, is essential. And you guys have done a really good job of getting as much of that as possible. Data continues to reinforce that in-person schooling is safe. Also, it continues to be the case that 100% remote learning is available to anyone that chooses this. Finally, I realize there are many unsung heroes this school year, and I can't name them all here, but I want to give a special shout out to Mrs. Lancaster and Mr. Dunback at EHS. 
These two teachers have been a shining example during remote learning. Thank you all for your time and attention, as well as your continued service to the community. Thank you, Karis, appreciate it. All right, with that, we are going to turn to uh, Dan Partridge with the, uh, with the county, who's uh, agreed to join us here this evening. Appreciate uh, you joining us. Um, it, if we would, we might turn it over to you just to start. If, if you have maybe some updates for us, kind of on the latest uh, uh, you've seen, uh, both in terms of the, um, the, the, the positivity rate and frequencies and, and, and the, the testing that's going on in the county, as well as any recent changes that have been made by the county to the recommendations that we're receiving. It looks like you might be on, on mute still, Dan. I'm sorry. <clears throat> sorry. Thank you for inviting me. And um, I'll cover some things. And then if I, if you have questions, please uh, ask them and I'll, I'll uh, attempt to answer. I'll start with the briefing that we give each week to Unified Command that kind of goes over the, just where we are as far as case count and um, hospitalizations and positivity rate. Um, and the thing that really stands out to me this week and what, what I led off on this this afternoon with Unified Command was our active case count. It stands at 1,223 right now today. And with a population of 122,000 in Douglas County, that's 1% or one out of every 100 people actively have COVID right now today in Douglas County. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the glass half empty. Look at, the, look at our numbers that, that uh, we have more active cases than we ever have. Um, and uh, overall, we've had over 7,000 uh, collectively or cumulatively. Um, the good news though is um, when you compare our rates in Douglas County with the state of Kansas, um, we are doing relatively well. If you were to take the Douglas County rate, for example, of disease and hospitalizations and deaths and um, extrapolate that out to the state of Kansas, if the rest of Kansas mirrored Douglas County, there would be uh, over 80,000 fewer cases of COVID, there would be over 2,000 fewer hospitalizations, and there'd be over 2,000 fewer deaths. And I point that out because I think it's an indicator of uh, the great job this community has done, what you have done, each, each school board, each um, you know, um, parent, you know, we've done this together. So I, I thank you for helping us you know, achieve such great results. But as great as they are relatively in absolute terms, I go back to that one in a hundred of us are currently sick with COVID today. So we, we have a lot of work yet to do. Um, but the work we've been doing has, has been effective. And so, so thank you. On the percent positivity rate, that's a, that's a number that I've seen here over the last three months or so kind of go in four week cycles. So um, you know, every four weeks it tends to go up and then it'll drop for a while. So right now we're on the uptick um, and in Eudora last week, your percent positive was 19%. This week, it's uh, almost 13%. Um, for comparison, Douglas County last week was just under 10% and just under 8% this week. So Eudora has been kind of um, at the, on the higher end of percent positivity re recently. Um, and we're also as a community kind of on that up, uptick. Uh, you know, uh, so, um, one of the things that we have seen as we uh, make these calls to positive cases in our disease investigation, seems like a lot of this spread, a lot of this, um, the numbers that we see are related to uh, New Year's, end of year kind of get togethers and social gatherings. And so kind of like what we saw around Halloween as well. Um, so uh, we have, to remain vigilant and, and keep doing the right thing and, uh, you know, and then also get ready to complete the task of vaccinating our communities. Right now we're in phase one, um, focusing on healthcare workers. Um, in addition, there's kind of a separate stream where our long-term care facilities 
um, are getting vaccinated as well, um, kind of through a, a separate uh, uh, process. Um, we anticipate that if vaccine supplies continue like they did this week, this week we got about 3,000 doses in. And if that keeps up, we hope that sometime in, in early to mid-February, we can finish the, the first phase one of healthcare workers. We, that's about 7,000 uh, people needing two doses. So we need to get receive about 14,000 doses um, before uh, we can move to the next phase. And that next phase is uh, people over 65, um, people in congregate settings, and then high contact um, essential workers. And in that group would be um, you know, school t teachers and, and uh, individuals such as that. So that's where some members of, uh, you know, that, that um, uh, are here tonight and, and uh, who you represent will, will become available for, for vaccination. Um, so we've, we've had plans in place to do, to do that work. During the Unified Command meeting, we, we got, um, the request was made pretty much by every superintendent. Hey, can you provide another solution other than walk, going through the Douglas County Fairgrounds? That's our, that's our primary site for vaccinations. Um, I heard that, we'll work on that. I, I can't make any promises, but um, you know, we're gonna do everything we can to make sure that, that every barrier that, that we can knock down, we knock down so that the teachers and critical staff um, can get vaccinated in that phase two. Um, phase three would be um, other adults, uh, you know, between 16 and 64 with, with medical conditions that put them at risk and then other critical workers. Phase four would be um, kind of the risk, excuse me, the remainder of the high risk population. And then phase five would be, would be everyone else. Um, and the timing on any of that is completely speculation at this point because it's all completely contingent on vaccine supply, which right now still has not um, uh, been flowing too too heavily right now. So we still need to have make improvements on vaccine supply. And um, you know, with that, I guess I'll stop and ask if there are questions or comments that you'd like to make. Hearing you talk that you're working on other possible solutions than just the county fairgrounds, would it be possible, because I know I've seen this being shown in other counties and in other states, that we get our school nurses vaccinated and then allow the school nurses to vaccinate the employees in their building so that way they're not having to take time off or go out of their way to get it done? Um. Yeah, I think we want to explore what that might look like. School nurses should, should, you know, they're in that phase one right now. So if your school nurses are, haven't been plugged in yet, please please reach out and we'll get them plugged in because we, we want to vaccinate them now. Um, but yeah, that was in my mind, kind of what we, I talked about with staff this afternoon is, is you know, yeah, our, we're aware that, you know, we're keenly aware that we don't have, you know, an abundance of staff, but if we could find other ways to extend our staff, like what you were saying with school nurses, we need to explore that. In terms of um, those with the vaccine, um, and in, in case of having two, two doses, um, at this point it appears the county's position is that provides them with either 30 or 90 days of immunity, I believe. Is that accurate from the county's perspective? Um, I'm not sure where the 30 or 90 days come in. There's uh, <clears throat> been lots of conversation and you know, research tends to kind of you know, continue to evolve the number, but there was you know, early on talk that the, uh, the protection of vaccine would provide would wane after let's say six months or so. Um, I, I saw that the, the the news come across, I didn't really uh, take the time yet to, to look into it, but I think that number is going to continue to be longer rather than shorter as more research and, and frankly, more time evolves. I mean, even the, you know, people who took this vaccine during trials, um, you know, all of this is completely new and evolving. And so I think the number, the, the uh, 
efficacy of the vaccine will, um, you know, continue to demonstrate a longer uh, uh, effective period. Sounds like, Steve, we may need to get some clarification from the county since they advised that uh, a person with two doses of the vaccine would not, would be considered, <clears throat> would have immunity from close contact rules for just 90 days. So it sounds like that isn't necessarily uh, the right length of time. Well, I think we're trying to conflate two somewhat different um, issues. Um, when you talk collectively at a population level, you can make certain statements and claims, but when you talk about an individual, there's, it's just not, there's no way to really know because no vaccine is 100% effective, meaning that if you give it to 100 people, there might be two people that for whatever reason, um, that immunity isn't, doesn't produce. The body doesn't react and respond to the vaccine in, in the way that produces immunity. So when, we, when it comes to close contacts and quarantines, we, we err on the side of caution and assume that that person is one of those, very, those few that where immunity didn't take on or you know, take hold. Um, but that doesn't mean collectively um, in different scenarios that um, the vaccine isn't effective. In part, that's why, you know, one of the first thing questions we got asked the day the vaccine was starting to deliver it is, can I stop wearing my mask? Well, no, we don't, we don't want you to do that because um, there is no guarantee that you're, you're no long, that, that you no longer are uh, a potential source of spread. questions oh, Becky I think maybe what uh, maybe that uh, uh, would be helpful is just to uh, the the county if I understand correctly updated their quarantine mandate recently to reflect that if you'd had a PCR positive confirmed COVID case in the last 30 days, or I'm sorry, excuse me, the last 90 days, or you'd been fully vaccinated with your se second dose within the last 90 days, then you were exempt from the quarantine for close contact. It's not saying that you're guaranteed to be immune for that time, it's that you no longer fall under the quarantine uh, mandate for those 90 days. I think that was maybe the clarification that we were needing. All right, I'm sorry, that, that's, maybe if I could ask Steve, if you could follow up with me tomorrow, because I'm not sure I'm tracking the original question now. Yeah, Dan, we can do that. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear that question. Earlier, one of our community members talking about the uh, recent, um, as of last week, the antibodies and the presence of antibodies as opposed to a uh, positive test um, and that um, exclusion from a, uh, the uh, quarantine period from a close contact. Can you just comment about the county's current position on that antibody test? Exclusion, you mean, are we gonna require isolation and quarantine if, if um, you test out? Is that, uh, yes, if you have the presence of those antibodies, does that change any of the uh, close contact quarantine? Um, we have modified our definitions somewhat to conform with uh, some guidance that KDHE put out probably a month ago about um, if you are um, 
you know, in isolation or quarantine and you um, on day seven test negative that you can move out. But um, that's the only modification that, that we've made to, to isolation or quarantine. But any updates about uh, having antibodies, whether or not you uh, positive or negative test, but just the presence of antibodies? The, well, if, if you've been a, if you were a positive case, we know who you are, um, and so it's confusing to me why why a, the test. I mean, we we know whether you've been positive or not. Dan, I think if I can clarify, I, I, I I'm going to try and and re reword the question. I you're. You're correct, um, Dan, in that if you are a confirmed positive case, you know who we are. But there are certainly cases that have not been tested as positive that were positive. I think what Lynn's saying is, medically, as of today, the best method we have for identifying people who have uh, had the disease without testing positive for it is an antibody test. And I think there is some momentum in some places to try to utilize antibody tests um, as, a, as another, I'll, I'll call it an exemption, just as we talked about exemptions for those who have had positive results, uh, test results, um, and those who have been vaccinated, that an antibody test as a, as a mechanism for identifying those who have in fact been positive without testing positive per se. Um, and I, I think what we're asking is, is, is there any consideration of utilizing that antibody test as a as another mechanism for um, modification to those those quarantine rules, um, I wouldn't. To date, there hasn't been. Um, we we've, we've been comfortable and felt like the better uh, approach was to be conservative. Um, we we've made the change that I just talked about reluctantly, and um, it, um, but we did. But I don't, I don't see any, any uh, desire to, to move to the, where you're going with, with this. Can you also comment, uh, I know that we expressed some interest in having a, uh, from a, a mental aspects um, also considered as part of the command. And I understand that uh, the executive director, Mr. Schmitz has joined or has started some being part of that conversation. And can you just comment on what, what kind of conversations that has included and what that has brought to that table when those considerations? Um, we, additional, an additional work group was added to Unified Command called Community Wellbeing. And Patrick Schmitz, the CEO of Burton Ash, and, uh, is one of the leads on that. And they put together a, uh, a right now it's like an awareness campaign and some some online resources and some uh, ramping up of uh, resources through Burt Nash and others. So there's a Douglas County Cares campaign to try to raise awareness of, of how where people can go to reach out for help. Um, and so um, the work's ongoing, but um, I would say still ramping up. So it sounds like that's mostly just for um to bring awareness to the resources, not necessarily to factor in um, any kind of considerations from a health perspective, and then also the mental well-being, um, and any of the recommendations. Is that fair? Well, no. There, Burton Ash is working to put teams in place to to uh, to respond to community need. Okay, but. I, is the recommendations also factor those things in or is it purely just the medical aspects as far as recommendations for the schools and um, when we are in hybrid and those kind of uh, considerations? Well, mental health, if you're asking, is there mental health being part of what's being considered, that's yes. Okay, it, it's, I apologize. It sounded like before you were saying that the mental health aspects are trying to raise awareness. If one identifies, self-identifies that they might need some resources trying to ramp up that campaign. So I might've misunderstood your statement. Well, uh, for example, Burt Nash has, has uh, been offering support groups, small group sessions for different organizations. Um, I know they're reaching out to uh, healthcare organizations um, right now and 
Um, maybe Steve knows. Uh, I thought Patrick talked this morning about also reaching out to school systems, but don't hold me to that because I don't remember with 100% clarity what he said today. I know that obviously with the RAP program that we have and the uh, social workers that we have in each of one of our facilities, that that continues to be an ongoing effort uh, to support students uh, wherever it is that they are. So that, that would be uh, very much a direct uh, link to Burt Nash and the work that they continue to do. I think the awareness piece and the education piece and the ramping up of those teams is in addition to what is already being uh, provided in terms of support to, in our case, to the school districts. Anyone else have any questions for Dan? I have a quick question just uh, and maybe this is a, I don't know if this is a better question for Dan or for Steve, but can someone speak to the asymptomatic testing program and where we're at on that as far as it pertains to our staff and students in Douglas County and in Eudora specifically? Steve well, I can, probably knows. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I, I can tell you that that, that, is, uh, that is very active, that testing, asymptomatic testing is very active. Uh, I would suspect that that the number of individuals, either staff or students, who are participating in that has grown uh, since the initial uh, net was cast, if you will, as far as those that wanted to participate. Um, I think we've had pretty, really good turnout. Very impressed with uh, the, the, the turnaround time. Uh, I can uh, submit a test to... Uh, Today, could do that, drop that off at LMH this afternoon, and before I am uh, at work in the morning, I'm going to have my uh, results back. So the turnaround time is very, very quick. Uh, the, the asymptomatic testing, the, the saliva test is very simple. Um, and so, I, you know, we, we've not, um, we, for Eudora, anyone who's wanted to take that test, uh, uh, we've made those tests available to them, whether that's a part of that normal routine or, or if they feel like it's something that they want to do in addition to, to uh, the 10% uh, that they're doing. If, it, if, it, if this is not their month, they're, we're getting staff who uh, are voluntarily wanting to, to continue to participate in that. So I, from our end of things, from what we can tell, uh, I think that that's gone very, very well. And then at a community countywide level, we're, there's about 2,500 to 3,000 tests being done each week. Anything else for Dan this evening? All right, with that, we will uh, release you, Dan. Appreciate you joining us this evening. Thank you, Dan. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> we have um, some, obviously some more to discuss about this because of the today, the decision today. Steve, would, do we want to cover that now or did you want to update us during your report? Okay. All right, we will move on to our annual reorganization and appointments. Um, we need to elect new officers and also establish meetings this evening. Um, first up is election of the board president. Um, for those of you, maybe Samantha may not remember, but for those of you here last January, um, at that time when I was nominated, I, I accepted, but I noted at that time that th this was going to be my final year serving uh, as the board president. Um, been in this role since 2012, and it's been an an honor and a privilege um, to lead this board, uh, but I, I definitely feel like it is, um, you know, a, a position that should see somewhat regular change for a different voice, for a different vision, um, and, and I just, I think probably 
you know, eight and a half years has been uh, been long enough for, for at least uh, this time around. So uh, with that, I will be, um, you know, uh, I guess ending my time as president here in a few minutes. And uh, we do need a nomination uh, for someone to sit in this seat or sit in this role, I should say. I, I'm kind of comfortable in this seat tonight, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Uh, I would, I would like to to thank you, Eric, for your uh, service in the the president seat there. Um, uh, obviously, I'm still relatively new, but as you guys know, I've been hanging around, loitering around these meetings for a while, and you've done a fantastic job of keeping the trains running on time, as they say, and all of that. And I appreciate that very much. Um, and if the if the floor is open to nominations I have someone I would like to nominate all right I appreciate that are you ready for that portion or yep if anybody else has any yeah that's fine if uh, anyone else I, has comments okay go ahead go ahead Becky. I would like I would like to, are we ready for nominations or no <laughs> sorry yeah that's fine that's fine is that okay mm -hmm. sorry I, I think I have a little bit of a delay I, I apologize I would like to nominate Mike Kelso uh, for board president. Okay, we have a, a, a motion or a nomination for Mike. Mike, is this a... I would agree with yes. I'd also be interested, I know that we typically see from a vice president stepping into that role, so I don't know if, Joe, if you're also interested or? Well, I appreciate that uh, consideration. I, I, I did put some thought into whether it's a role I wanted to take on, and I actually, I spoke to Eric about kind of the, what was involved there, um, and I, I spoke to Mark, who's been here since uh, the Spanish flu, um, so he's, he's seen <laughs> his, his time here, and I think, um, at this time, it's not a role that I'm I'm interested in taking on, um, and I, I certainly respect Mike for for being willing to to consider that. Um, during the course of my conversations, I also spoke as I spoke to Mark. Um, I, I I think Mark expressed a a willingness to consider that a, as well, um, and I certainly don't want to make this a Trump Biden sort of scenario um, where we you know, everything falls apart. But I, I guess as, as a result of those conversations, I, I would also um, like to, to suggest or n nominate, I don't know, um, Mark for consideration for that role. And I, I don't know if you guys want to arm wrestle or what, but um, I, I certainly think Mark and, and Mike both who have served here very well for a long time, I would, I would respect either of them in that position. Um, but I will go ahead and nominate Mark as well. Anyone else uh, want to throw their hat in the ring? I'm the big girl, don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'm not sure what protocol is in this situation. I, I assume we um, we ask for a second. Uh, do, we, we need, do we need a second person for a nomination? Should ask for the nominations to be closed, ask for per that. Robert's rules or per, uh, uh, not that we follow Robert's rules, but per parliamentary procedure, which we do follow. So if the nominations are closed, then we do just a round the table vote? Or however we decide to. Closing the nominations. Great parliamentary procedure requirements, correct? <laughs> As your last ask here, you can. Uh, well, you, you know, we. You can say you, you, you do it. And before we get to that point, Mark, I uh, haven't heard from you. From you. Do you? Are you? Uh, yes, I would be willing to do so. Okay. Do it. All right. Well, with that, we can uh, we can go around the table and. 
I guess, vote. So, uh, Joe, start with you. Yeah, I, again, I'm very supportive of, of both individuals. I, I'll, I'll vote for Mark as um, the next president. We'll go with Becky. Becky, uh, how do you vote? Uh, I, I would <laughs> echo that. Uh, uh, obviously, both very qualified uh, candidates here, uh, but I'll, I'll cast my vote for Mike. Okay. Samantha? Um, echo the sentiment. Uh, thank you, everyone, is the new girl here. <laughs> everyone has been <laughs> very welcoming. I have appreciated, um, Eric, your leadership. I'm probably not supposed to go on and on when you're casting your vote, um, but I appreciate everyone's tenure here and um, their leadership, and I will cast my vote for Mark. Mark, you willing to? I guess we'll we'll, we'll move <laughs> along. <laughs> well, well, I, I will say that um, you know I think uh, just just given the years uh, we, we got two good candidates because of their their experience, um, their approach, and you know they know a lot about the district. Uh, I would say that just um, probably in the last year, um, I, I feel like Mark has demonstrated a, um, some some balance in really hearing all sides and I, I think he more than anyone else has um, not stuck firmly to you know this side of thinking or that side of thinking. he's been pretty consistent and down the middle and um, you know I, I think that that would serve us well to have a, a leader who's um, you know isn't necessarily going to vote like two or three other people might always vote so I, I I would I would put my vote behind Mark just be short and sweet. I'll also just vote for Mark. All right. With that, then I guess. You should abstain. <laughs> yeah. You should abstain. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. With that, uh, yes, congratulations. Yeah. Um, and that's to Mike probably more than anybody. But <laughs> he, he dodged a bullet here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's. All right. Um, with that, we need a vice president, but I will turn the duties over to Mark at this point. Well, thank you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would also like to echo that. We can do that. Let's, let's do a formal. I move that we approve the uh, vote of Mark as president for the next school year or okay. the next all uh, second year okay joe and lynn um all those in favor say aye 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 aye, aye. any opposed aye okay motion carries all right now all right I'm officially well done. you are officially done <laughs> i i would also like to say to eric that i think you've just done an outstanding job uh somebody alluded that i've been on the board for a long time which is true and i've had the privilege of working with a lot of really good presidents but i would i would rank eric as one of the best that we've had in the district so thank you, thank you very much for your passion and your dedication to the district and we will continue to lean on you as well uh, going forward so thanks so with that um, we need to open up uh, nominations for vice president so Mike, are you willing to take on the role of vice president? Sure. I would nominate Mike for the role of vice president. Is there a second? I would second that nomination. I would. Okay. Yes. Nominate. Thank you. Second. S second with Becky. Um, so we have a nomination and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Aye. <laughs> there was a delay. Yeah, was a delay. <laughs> that was not an opposed. <laughs> So, very good. So, motion approved. <laughs> uh, the next thing on the agenda is to talk about time of meeting. Um, I guess we've kind of had some conversations about potentially starting earlier, um, but we need to set the date, uh, Thursday and the time. So, are there any, any comments or thoughts about that? Uh, and just what was the, for the records, what were the times were we talking about from earlier? I, I've just heard different early? people say they would like to move it earlier seven so. it's or early six thirty six, or yeah. six any of any of those three i would 
personally be opposed to that just because of traveling from a work perspective uh, in Kansas City. Uh, but if it's the majority rule, I obviously will try to do what I can. Any other thoughts? I, I would vote for an, an earlier time, whether that was 6 or 6.30. Uh, I think sometimes our meetings go pretty late, and so if we can start a little bit earlier, that would be preferable. I have confidence that our new board president is going to get us out of here quickly, but I would say, <laughs> I'd be, I'd, I'd say I maybe we say. Split, split it down the middle. I'd, I'd be like the 6.30 seems appealing to, to go a few minutes earlier and, and hopefully still be able to get here from, from work. Six. In, in a non-COVID world, I'm also a commuter, so I empathize with what that, but who knows what that's going to look like as well. Um, but yeah, so probably 6.30, I would, I, I kind of like 7, but I would go with 6.30. Yeah. We're actually already back at work in Kansas City, so I, yeah. Mm -hmm. or, so uh, that's why, uh, and it's already interesting, the traffic is definitely picking up, um, so it's coming back quickly. I would be interested in hearing if there's any feedback from the administrative staff and, and technical staff that help us put these meetings together and put them on if that time change would be any kind of a, a struggle for them. Would not be. I see, I see. Becky, but mm -hmm. the, uh, we got essentially thumbs up from yeah. the building administrators. <laughs> so I guess I'm hearing that 6:30 is a good idea. Do we need a motion for that? Yes. Um, I move that we approve resolution 2101, establishing the meeting dates with a 6:30 p.m. start time, as presented. Is there a second? I will second that. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motions approved, be 6.30 on Thursdays going forward. And we have a resolution here that everyone will need to, to sign to establish that. Set the meeting time. That's <laughs> Good job, Eric. <laughs> so that takes us to consent items. I need a motion to approve the consent items. I would like to, uh, hey, we're oh, we're good? Okay, we're good. Does anybody have? I'll make the motion unless someone has a question. I'll move. We approve the consent items as presented. Eric with the motion. Is there a second? Second. Joe with the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion's approved. Okay, so that takes us to communications, and I believe we have Amy up next. Floor is good yours. Evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm board members, Mr. Sleekle. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Um, hold on. I need to sign back in. Technology. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay, and hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So thank you for allowing me to take a few moments tonight um, to provide an update on the status of employee health and wellness in the Adore School District. Um, first of all, it's, it's kind of two sections split into two sections. I will provide you with some data that has been provided to us by our health insurance provider, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Kansas. 
And then um, it was assembled by our benefits broker, UKD Companies, and then conclude by presenting some initiatives that we've taken this year in the wellness committee and the wellness program, and then also to discuss the future of the plan. So I just wanna begin by stating that this year has been anything but ordinary. Of course, I don't need to tell that um, to any of you in this room um, or watching anywhere. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has altered our lives in ways that have resulted in disruptions in routine preventative care for our members. Um, there's been lower claims that have been paid out as staff were not able to schedule appointments uh, with providers. Um, in June, our plan was actually issued a refund um, in our dental program from Blue Cross and Blue Shield um, because of premiums that were paid in April um, due to dental offices being closed um, during the, the shutdown, of course. So those claims, they didn't pay out any claims, so we got the money back. Um, so it was a nice surprise. Um, so we may not realize, however, the long-term implications um, for several years as these lapses in preventative care may take a toll on our members' health. Um, this slide here just represents the total premiums that have been paid for the past three years, as well as cost per employee per month. Um, this represents kind of how the, the plan runs on a day-to-day -day basis um, and managed cost. Premiums and costs have remained relatively stable over the past three years. Um, but this has been due in part to plan redesigns, favorable returns, and the health defined benefit making the plans more, afford more affordable, therefore attracting new employees to the plan. And this also shows a plan that is running well and containing cost. The next three slides um, represent the amount of claims that have been paid relative um, to premiums paid in a rolling 12 month period over the past three years as well as employee participation on a month to month basis. I'm gonna stick on this slide for just a minute and then I'll, I'll go to the other two. Um, I'm not an expert in data analytics by any means, um, but do wanna point out the far right column, um, which is the loss ratio column. The loss ratio actually represents the amount collected in premiums versus the amount paid in claims. The industry benchmark, um, what we would strive for is 80%. Um, that means that whoever we're working with is realizing a profit with our group. Eudora is currently running at a loss ratio of 65%. Um, this is an indication that the plan is performing very well. In other words, we're paying Blue Cross and Blue Shield more per month in premiums that we're spending on claims, um, kind of the difference between these two numbers right here. Um, the past 12 months show a profit of approximately $400,000 for Blue Cross and Blue Shield. I believe this percentage is worth noting um, as it illustrates the idea that the district should and will consider self-insured plans in the future, um, possibly as early as the upcoming renewal. A self-insured plan would provide the school district and its employees with greater flexibility in plan design and provide opportunities to take advantage of prescription drug rebates that you do not receive in a fully insured plan. Um, you may also realize in comparing premiums paid on average over the past three years, that this year is slightly higher than last year, 17, 18, 18, 19, and I'm referring to this average number here. Um, I believe this is because our employees have had the ability to decrease their premiums by participating in incentive programs and are selecting plans with richer benefits. So obviously those cost more um, per month and, but our employees are getting better plans. Okay. And in viewing the prior two years, the loss ratio has decreased by nearly 20% indicating the plan's performance has continued to trend upward. Okay, um, the next three slides represent the largest claims filed over the past three 12 month periods. So for the last three plan years, years, excuse me, large claims have decreased overall by 32% from 2017-2018 to the 2019-2020 school year. This slide represents the amount paid by the plan for various diagnoses and conditions. I removed um, all of the actual diagnosis to protect the employee confidentiality with the exception of the preventative care category. The largest single category in claim spending is for preventative care, indicating that our staff 
take the wellness program seriously and make an intentional effort to improve their health and well-being. Preventative care would include items such as annual well exams, mammographies, colonoscopies, and vaccinations. So our employees are, are getting this done and this, this shows it. And then at our top drug um, category in relation to healthcare spending, I just wanna point out that the majority of our spending in the prescription drug category is for specialty drugs. Um, as a result, spending on generic drugs has decreased as many specialty drugs may not have a generic alternative available. And overall, our district employees are doing a good job of utilizing generic drugs when they're available, and this saves the, pl the plan money overall. And the district continues to provide resources for programs such as GoodRx and Blue Cross Blue Shield programs that assist employees in determining the best treatment of chronic disease and other conditions. The last slide on the topic of medical spending shows the overall spending for the plan year that ended in September of 2020 and compares spending in health and pharmacy. So as the chart indicates, nearly 40% of our overall spending is in the prescription drug category. And this is an area that leaves little room for plan adjustments and a fully insured plan, which kind of points to another reason we should consider self-insured. Okay, switching gears now um, from healthcare spending and cost, um, just want to discuss for a few minutes the employee wellness program. Um, like I said in the beginning, this year has been a difficult year for wellness initiatives. Goals for this year have been less about physical fitness and more about self care and well being. Our wellness program encompasses the area of financial and mental wellness as well as physical health and nutrition. Um, I was happy to hear that Douglas County is taking a priority in their community well-being initiatives in the Douglas County Cares project. I'm um, anxious to see what kind of resources that will provide for our employees as well. So LMH employees administered flu shots to district employees in September and biometric screenings in the month of October. COVID testing has been made available to any employee that wants it. Um, wants to participate on a pretty much a bi-weekly basis is what we're doing now. Um, receiving the results in as little as 24 hours, as Steve mentioned earlier. Um, testing in this, in addition to many other mitigation techniques, have met, been our strongest defense in fighting the COVID-19 virus and keeping employees in our classrooms and our buildings. I'm sure that um, I will not shock anyone when I confess that the spring, summer, and fall of 2020 have been very difficult. Teachers have had to navigate and learn new online teaching methods. Staff have had to cope with concerns and anxiety about their own health and that of their close friends and family. And we have had staff all or in and out of quarantine and isolation situations nearly all year long. Goals for the school year included fostering a culture that promotes a positive work-life balance. Remote learning and teaching due to due to the pandemic, created a feeling that you were always connected to work in some way. What used to be a place to rest and relax turned into workspaces for many of our employees, myself included. Throughout the year, employees have been encouraged to unplug when possible and take advantage of downtime to focus on families and practice self-care. At the beginning of the year, we invited Jane Shirley as a wellness nurse from Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Kansas to um, provide um, kind of a seminar to all of our district employees with self that involved self-care tips and techniques to um, recognize stress and how to deal with it. Employees of the district are frequently encouraged to take advantage of our employee assistance, assistance program, excuse me, and were recently provided with wallet cards so that they would have instant access to contact information when they needed it. Weekly updates are provided to act as reminders to employees that their health and well-being is important and should be made a priority. The EAP not only provides 24 seven access to counselors, um, but also contains many resources on their website, including articles on topics like the management of stress and finances, work and career transitions, family and relationships and substance abuse and addiction. Shifting back to our physical wellness, um, it should be noted that there were many limitations created by the pandemic, preventing some employees from participating in the biometric screenings and making it difficult to um, 
gather in gyms or, or other facilities um, where you could get a group workout together. For this year only, employees will be allowed to substitute volunteer service to receive incentive points that would have otherwise been lost um, due to not being able to participate in screenings. Despite the virus, um, there still were 68 participants in the biometric screenings that we held in October, um, of course, compared to 78 last year. In a typical year, we would have already had at least one wellness challenge, and the hope is to organ organize a virtual marathon in the spring that staff will be able to participate in. I've had several staff members ask about it, so I think that they really enjoy them and, and look forward to them. And Cardinal Cardio continues to be a valued tool in our wellness program. I'd like to conclude by discussing the future of our wellness program. This year, we've added three new members to our committee, um, and hopefully they will, I know they will, bring new ideas and vision to the plan. Um, like Eric said, it's sometimes you, you need new people to come in and, and give you some fresh vision. So I'm looking forward to see what new ideas they will bring. Our first meeting of the year will be held in February and will be a half day planning session to discuss, our, to discuss our spring fitness challenge as well as review our overall mission and future of the program. The program is in year three of our three year plan. It typically takes three to five years before any results um, from a wellness program become visible and therefore tangible in any way. And at this point, the plan is to stay the course and explore additional opportunities for employees to create a healthy work-life balance. It's not only results in a more engaged and healthy workforce, but also serves as a recruiting tool as we work towards creating a culture that values employee well-being. Some of the areas that will be explored by the committee in the coming months will include how the district can take advantage of programs such as WorkWell Kansas and grant programs through, offered through Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Um, Blue Cross and Blue Shield did just release a program called Strive um, from WebMD. It is a disease and management wellness, a disease and wellness management program where members can take advantage of one-on-one -on -one nursing um, support at no additional cost to them or to the plan. Um, so stay tuned, we'll see where we go. That is all that I have. Um, any questions? Stop sharing. How much uh, did we, to... oh, go ahead, <laughs> Becky, go ahead, go ahead. First of all, I'd like to say I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're looking at options for maybe doing a self-insured possibility in the future. Because if I'm understanding your presentation right, it sounds like what our needs are, we're maybe getting overcharged by you know the private insurance company for for what we need. And I'm a little bit familiar with what. Um, for instance, Douglas County for their employees, um, their health insurance is the program. And so maybe not at this point. Um, can you hear me now? You're, you're breaking up quite a bit, so we're missing. Okay, now. <laughs> I didn't I'll, hear most of the questions. I'll, just, I'll email you. <laughs> that will work. That's okay. Uh, I'll just, I'll email you my question about okay. the self-insured. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Becky. <laughs> how, I'm sure it's not that much because it was dental insurance, but how much was the amount we were rebated back? It was um, every employee received their entire premium that they paid in that month. Okay, so, so, we did get, so we did give it back to people then? Yes, sir. All right, great, thank you. It was refunded to our employees. I think that, uh, I, number one, I'm, I'm grateful for uh, Amy's leadership in guiding us through this process. It's been, the wellness piece has been a monumental undertaking. Uh, it Obviously it falls under her duties as HR director, but she's taken this thing on and I think uh, is, has been the ideal person to, uh, to champion that. One of the things to keep in mind about anything self-insured is that there's, uh, once, once you kind of get started, there's a whole lot of undertaking mm -hmm. that has to be done and that's certainly something that we wouldn't be doing by ourselves, that, that uh, you, Katie, would be helping uh, guide us along the way. And there'd obviously be some 
some uh, pretty in-depth communications and, and uh, workshops because uh, I'm sure that staff will have questions related to, to their health care and their benefits. So, uh, But it, it is something that we've had some conversations about probably, I don't know, Amy, four years now we've talked a little bit about this. Yes, and trying uh, to find the right time to jump, I think, is where we're at. So, right, and it's just you know, it's an explore an exploration. Um, so definitely not meaning that we would just jump into it lightly, but definitely should look at any options that would um, be a more efficient way to spend our dollars. Any other questions or comments? Amy, thank you very much. Your leadership has been ter terrific in all of this, and uh, <laughs> baptism <you>. by fire. <laughs> thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move to superintendent report. A couple items really quick. Uh, January is board member appreciation month. Uh, the uh, I don't think anybody could have envisioned uh, the pandemic and the impact that that's had. I know that uh, that has uh, weighed on each of you individually, collectively. Uh, I know that there's been a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of communications, conversations about what's going on and how it's how it's going or how it's not going, and just uh, very very grateful for the leadership that this board provides to the school district. Uh, it's imperative that. Um, that, that we have strong leadership, and I think that this board has given us that, uh, that guidance and that direction, even though the, the route has been rough at times and certainly uh, winding as we've, as we've navigated those waters. So a couple items, uh, the seats that you are in, uh, that is a, a, a generous contribution from the Eudora Schools Foundation uh, through some private uh, contributions that have made those uh, chairs possible. Uh, so please try to stay awake as you uh, <laughs> sit in those. Uh, but I'm grateful, uh, and I think that that's just a testament to community support for the work that you do. Uh, also have a little token of appreciation. I can pass down here. And yours, Mark, Eric, and Samantha. Your names are on those. and. It isn't much, but it is a little uh, token of appreciation for boards, uh, board members uh, that uh, you might at some point put to good use, but I think it's a good, uh, good uh, token of appreciation for a job well done. No, there's, there, there is no Powerball in there, Joe. Uh, I know that's what you're looking for, but uh, anyway, again, just a, a deep sense of gratitude and appreciation for the work that you uh, do on a on a daily basis, sometimes uh, monthly, otherwise. Ron and I were making the comment today, tonight, that it, we actually made it a month between yeah. board meetings, yeah. normal normal uh, schedule. So grateful for that. Um, <laughs> hopefully, it didn't jinx us. A uh, couple other quick items. Stay interview. Um, I believe uh, have shared some some background around that. Obviously, in the past, uh, we've launched that sometime right before spring break. Um, have allowed for a window of time that closed shortly after we returned from spring break. Well, last year we didn't get any kind of return. Uh, when we sent everybody home for spring break, we never saw them again uh, because of the shutdown and. And I think that, uh, you know, in some of the conversations that we've had, there's been generally a desire to try to look at that. Obviously, we want to be able to have the data in such a way that we can look at trends. And obviously, from a consistency standpoint in terms of timing, that impacts some of that. But in talking to Ken, we feel like we could move that up just a little bit, which might allow us to have a presentation to the board on the outcome of that, maybe in the April board meeting, which would be uh, a considerably uh, considerable amount earlier than uh, than in the May board meeting. So, unless board members would have some uh, argument, I think uh, Ken and I are working on a red line version. There's a couple of uh, minor edits that uh, he and I want to be able to take a look at, uh, but then it is our intent to uh, later in the month of February get that kicked out. 
so that then we can get that um, closed before we go off for uh, spring break, uh, if you will. So um, I guess unless the board would have uh, an argument otherwise, that would be uh, the vision that we have for that. Um, next item on the list is a facility tour. Um, and under our my tenure here, every year we've had a facility tour. Uh, historically, that has been done in February. It's a good opportunity for uh, the board to see the buildings in action uh, and take a look at things. This year might uh, be a different lens that we view that through from the standpoint of some of the uh, facility conversations that we've had and some of those things that maybe we want to look at just a little bit differently because we're engaging in that uh, in that process. Uh, historically that that uh, that time has been around that uh, second or third week of February. Uh, I, I guess if the board would uh, so entertain we'd try to get uh, that set up uh, and get a date picked. I think the 15th is a uh, the, that week is a no contact day, or is it the 14th? I don't want to speak out of turn here. 15th, I think, is a no uh, school day. Uh, so then we would end up looking at, or is it the 8th? Gosh. Um, so sometime that week we would try to take a look at <laughs> uh, having you in the buildings. And then I, I think... It, it would be our intent to be very strategic about the, the locations, the things that we would want you to be able to see. Uh, and, and, and I think the other side of that is, is that that's a good opportunity to just engage staff. Uh, you've had an opportunity to go shadow, so we've taken a, a collection of names of individuals that uh, we've, we've wanted to shadow. And maybe it makes sense because the shadow has historically been in the afternoon. Uh, maybe we would flip-flop our schedule a little bit and such that uh, maybe you do some shadowing in the morning and maybe see some uh, some classes or some uh, some programs that you haven't excuse me been able to see so I guess does any I guess for starters does anybody uh, any, any qualms about uh, going ahead and getting that set up and if if not then how does that week look for you uh, to take a take a day, it would be, uh, you know, obviously we start out with breakfast in the morning, and and you got lunch in there, and then whatever we sandwich in between. So, uh, is there a day that works better, or a day that is worse than uh, for board members if that's what you choose to do? My, my only concern, we collectively as a whole have done a good job, fantastic, of keeping the transmission in the buildings down. We, we've seen that that transmission has happened from out in the community, not in the building. Does it make sense to put individuals that haven't been in those buildings, some of us haven't, I know some have gone to sports events, into classrooms with kids or teachers or into the cafeteria if it's used? That's my only concern. I, I think that um, it goes without saying that the mitigation and the expectations that we have for our faculty and for our students would apply to board members if you uh, if you do this. So if you come into our uh, if you come in if you do indeed engage in this, you're going to get your temperature checked just like everybody else does. Uh, you'll be masked just like everybody else does. You'll uh, you'll do those things that uh, uh, everybody else uh, will be called upon to do. So from the standpoint of from from a meal standpoint, uh, obviously we could, under BC conditions, before COVID conditions, we could hunker down around two tables and everything would be okay. But uh, you know, I think part of the role of the board in this endeavor is to see it as our kids see it. So, uh, and I don't know, we haven't made any conclusive agenda, but you know, if if you're going to eat lunch at the uh, at the elementary school, we're going to have uh, a lot of space in between everybody at the elementary school. If we <laughs> go to the high school, you're going to sit two to a table because that's the way that our kids are sitting at, at, the, uh, at the high school. So I, I, I think that um, I don't know that I have a 
great concern that that would interrupt or cause problems. I'm not a doctor, but I, again, I think that uh, your work as a board and trying to best see uh, the things that need to be seen uh, can't be done at seven o'clock at night. So, yeah, I would I would agree. I think that t facility tour has just been a really huge asset to help us in making decisions and just getting to see things in their normal day-to-day -day routine. So um, I appreciate your concern, Mike, but I think we could take steps to make sure that we're all safe and doing the right things. I was just going to add, I really like the format. I understand we're going to modify it just as what the students have had to modify, but I also really appreciate the format. It is wonderful to go as a group for the actual facility tours. It's wonderful to have the breakout. So if possible, I'd still want to do that as far as the breakouts, understanding that we're going to have to, uh, just like the students, modify that breakout. Um, but it, it really is in impactful for the entire uh, duration as a school board member. Is there any date that doesn't, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, is, I, I would probably caution off of, uh, if we're off, yeah, never mind, I'll answer my own question. I, th I think that uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, somewhere in that neighborhood would be the, the day. Is there a better day or a worse day? looks like at this point it's wide okay. open. So. so we'll, we will, uh, the administrative team will uh, sit down and start to uh, hash out that and uh, try to take a look at that. If there's something in particular that the board would like to see, um, uh, and again, I, th I think that through looking through that lens of whatever the future holds in terms of growth or construction or remodel, uh, you know, let me know and we'll make sure that we try to figure out how to make that happen in terms of the uh, agenda, but we'll, we'll proceed accordingly. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I wanted to touch really quickly on is staffing. Uh, historically, uh, and again, we're referencing the before COVID, we would, uh, the administrative team, uh, operations team would have put together uh, a list of some positions that they would like to see uh, f moving forward and, and the, the good part about that is that I think that it, it has us looking to the future and looking to uh, uh, potential growth, it has us looking to potential needs and it has us looking certainly at potential opportunities uh, in terms of courses or programs that we might want to take a look at. Um, COVID has uh, certainly put uh, a, a little bit of a wrench in things. Um, our enrollment is down um, this year. Um, we got, uh, our, our auditor was in this week. Uh, we need to meet with him and take a look at some things to uh, have a clearer vision or a clearer picture of what that uh, looks like for sure. But I think, you know, there's some, there's some pieces of that that we've uh, I, I've pumped the brakes on setting that into motion, setting that, that process into motion. Uh, number one, I, I, I'm wanting to have a little bit uh, more time and a little bit clearer picture in terms of what our enrollment is and potentially what it could be before we start to take a look at adding uh, positions. If we don't have the money for uh, those positions and that's gonna come through the enrollment process, obviously, then, then that's going to be problematic. Um, so we're looking at uh, through the lens of uh, hitting the brakes, uh, just trying to be a, a bit more thorough in, in terms of what we're going to be uh, looking at. Uh, we may not end up uh, filling an open position depending on how things play out. Uh, we know that we've had two classes at the uh, elementary school, the, the K and the one, uh, those classes are just over 100 students, which is a departure from the norm, if you will. Uh, those classes, with the exception of the three bubble classes, at, at uh, uh, you know, our, our norm is roughly 125 to 135 in any given year. 
and if we are experiencing a, a population uh, slowdown in uh, terms of enrollment with two classes at 100, then it may be something that we need to uh, make sure that we're not uh, overextending ourselves with. So it's not, a, not that we are not planning or not having conversations or not trying to take a look at um, positions and staffing and needs but I don't know that we'll be as aggressive in terms of pushing that information out right now because quite honestly I don't want to I don't want to send the message that we've got we're going to do a B and C and then end up disappointing people because we can't do any of those um, so more of that work will be done internally uh, and then when the time when we feel like we're in a better position to make some determinations then we'll we'll get back into that process but I think right now with where we are it warrants a more cautious approach to staffing so just wanted to be clear because if you're looking at agendas and and so on from a year ago and trying to make some comparisons that would be uh, a departure from past practice for the last probably four or five years we've done that so or more or more so. <laughs> um, real quick uh, as Dan alluded to in the uh, presentation we did move the gating criteria to orange or the county moved the gating criteria to orange so starting Tuesday we'll move to uh, those uh, hybrid models in each one of the facilities um, we met as an administrative team this week and talked a little bit about uh, some of the nuances uh, associated with that. We also know that for the Kansas State High School Activities Association that there is a change coming barring something unforeseen. Uh, there is a change coming that would be effective the 29th of January where the uh, Keisha moratorium in terms of the number of spectators would be uh, then moved to a what is feasible at a local or permissible at a local or county level uh, and so we've had some conversations around what that would look like uh, as we move forward um, in all honesty it probably will become a uh, some kind of a ticket based uh, setup um, you know we're, we're talking about uh, a different capacity in inside the gymnasium as opposed to the football field for example or soccer field um, but that those also when looking at capacity that also takes into account things such as um, you know cheer students uh, dance team pep band uh, the visiting spectators and and those kinds of things so those are all pieces that uh, we are beginning to put plans in place for uh, as we move forward unless there would happen to be some um, deviation from where we are with the Kansas State High School Activities Association. So, so what, are the, what does that look like then uh, for middle school and high school next week? What, what does that hybrid look like? For middle school and elementary, there really won't be uh, a deviation from what they're doing at, at this point in time from the standpoint that all students will be in the uh, the uh, middle school will have will move back to their uh, hybrid model uh, that model is going to be Jeremy was talking today that after meeting with his teams there'll be some minor adjustments that they are collectively making but uh, in a nutshell that that model will go into play and then Ron will have his uh, hybrid model at the high school. <laughs> I'm sorry? The A, B. Every other day. Yeah. And then the middle school, oh, sorry, and then the middle school is all in one room. Correct. That one, right? Okay. A and I guess that I, that we, we've heard some feedback, but that seemed to work out well. 
the re revisions that we made back in December? Yeah, you probably need to Yeah, step but up. You, you need to step up. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll make some minor adjustments. Our BLT met um, the last day before break to kind of evaluate the orange model. Uh, it's not a perfect model. Uh, we know that. It's not a long-term fix like I had mentioned at the beginning. But it was good to have kids in the building. Um, you know, we, we know teachers don't feel like they're as, as, as effective as a teacher in a hybrid model as they are in person. Uh, we've talked about others, and I had one teacher bring up, doesn't matter what hybrid plan we really choose, they all kind of stink, and <laughs> it's we want to be in the building. But uh, due to the phase we're in, we just can't do that. Uh, but we are going to have students in the building. Um, we have families. Uh, we'll, I'll reach out to families tomorrow. But uh, we had some cho choose remote for a temporary time because we were ending a semester this time. Uh, if you choose remote, you're out for the whole quarter. So um, we hope this is a short-term deal. Um, I know Samantha saw it in person. Uh, having kids is, is good in the building. Um, they are in a room, um, but they are able to get out for PE and for a lot of different other activities. So. Was there any, uh, you had highlighted some of the um, unfortunate, the F, F rates have got, went up. Um, I assume it's too early to tell that short of getting the kids back in school if there was any impact on that, or can you comment on that? Um, our, our numbers went down when we went back to orange. Okay. It was very beneficial. I had even had uh, a couple teachers, I uh, had a SPED teacher tell me just having them in the building, we were able to just knock out um, all these missing assignments. Uh, we had some students, you know, it, I think it snowballed so much that they just never could see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but overall, we saw a huge change. Today's the end of our semester, so uh, we'll start fresh next week. Um, but for the most part, yes, having them in, we saw that number drop. It, it does seem as though the county appears to kind of be winging it at this point. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't appear that the, the gating criteria applies at this point. Um, I, I think it, I think the incident rate is, is clearly at near all-time high, and I, I, I understand that. I, I don't know if there's any value left then, though, in the other metrics. If before we kind of came down out of the orange or the red, but because the incident rate was so high, they left us there for an extra week. And in this case, with the positivity rate, um, you know, we, we would technically qualify for yellow, but again, the incident rate is higher, so they want us in orange. So I, I guess that's just something that I w would like the board to keep in mind is, you know, if if the gating criteria that they're using, um, if there is value there any longer, or if it is, if, if we shouldn't really hang our hat on any one number, we just are, are fine with whatever that, that body decides. I had the opportunity to listen to the uh, command group today. I happened to be near the office when it was on, and so uh, Steve asked me to listen in. And the, I think the major driver behind it was the 1% of the county that has COVID right now is what the major driver of keeping it or making it go to orange. But, uh, yeah, I kind of agree. Those numbers don't seem to... <laughs> have a lot of meaning anymore. But it's not just the one number. I mean, it's always been all of them combined into helping make the decision. I saw at one point last week that LMH's ICU beds were way over 50% occupied too, and that yeah. one scared me when I saw that one. I share those concerns, and I've been consistent as far as I think the best place is for our kids. Steve commented on that. I think that in our, uh, the letter that we're doing a good job in the schools of maintaining statistically their, where their source of getting um, COVID is not from the schools. And so, and I keep coming back to the mental health and having the schools. I personally have seen it. 
as kids who are solidly adjusted kids in school and what happened when they were at home and trying to maintain that um, was devastating to watch. So I am a strong advocate. I understand the numbers, I've seen those, and I still maintain the best place for our kids is back in the schools. So I do share, I am not, um, nor have been, uh, when the county declares it, that is not my one uh, lightning force of how we should be proceeding. Any other comments? I'll just share that I, the one thing, I guess the lens I keep looking through this too is that it's an ever evolving situation. The research, the vaccines, the mitigating, you know, in our schools, in, you know, in the community. And so just understanding as gating criteria comes out, research, what are we doing in school that it's just an ever changing, the information is always changing, the disease is ever changing. You know, just that the scope of what we're looking at is what we were thinking and doing six months ago is not the same place that we're at now. So th I guess those are my two senses when we're looking at everything is just to understand what was gold standard six months ago might not <laughs> be this, you know, at this time, but then also what we're doing in our buildings, you know, for mitigation and all of that is, I feel like we're using best practices as we keep going down the line. So I'm assuming notification will go out to families tomorrow, is that correct? Okay. All right, anything else? Let's move to board reports. We'll start with uh, schools foundation report, Samantha. Thank you. Um, yeah, the foundation, uh, so they were at the ribbon cutting for the new, um, the library update remodel refresh at the high school. Um, that, was a fun, that was a fun one. <laughs> um, also that in December, the foundation received $11,000 in grant funding from the United Way and Douglas County Community Foundation for the Cardinal Cares Funds. And that assists principals, counselors, and social workers in meeting those urgent, immediate, and basic human needs uh, to the Eudora students. Um, so anybody that does have an urgent, immediate, and basic human need, please see um, administration in your building for those needs. Since November, the foundation has served around 400 students and families through the Bird's Nest food pantries. Um, uh, and then my last note here is they're planning the first ever uh, school, Eudora Schools Foundation Giving Day for our community. That's going to be on Tuesday, March 2nd. Um, so it's really, uh, they're going to focus 24 hours towards encouraging the community to support the foundation. And there'll be more details to come on that. And thank you very much to the foundation for these chairs. Yes, indeed. They're very <laughs> comfortable. Thank you. <laughs> Um, interlocal report. Um, we are still, uh, we talk a lot about staffing and our paraprofessionals um, and the impact that that has, um, that we are considering uh, down 20%, uh, but then it was updated to 20, uh, approximately 20%. Uh, then there was also conversations um, from a budget perspective, obviously very cautionary as far as uh, what impacts that'll have, uh, but it's promising as far as uh, it will not be a major um, impact for us overall uh, from a school's perspective because of the various revenues that are coming in. And I think that that was about all I, what was the other major? Uh, our decision on board leadership was, we well, delayed we till next Monday. True or next month, because each of the three boards hadn't met to if some of the boards still have assignments they give out. So, and the, the budget piece that may look good, may look bad, is with us being down 20% in pairs, that's pretty much across the state. Everybody's that way, nobody mm -hmm. can, can get fully staffed. And categorical aid, is a pot that gets divided based on the number of FTEs. Well, if the number of FTEs is down, then categorical aid per person may go up, but if we don't have the bodies, we won't get it. So it's a double-edged sword. So it's, it's possible we may get more money next year from that, but that's if we would have more people, so. <laughs> okay. Very 
good. And we, we all celebrated the fact that um, the Eudora teacher at EHS yeah. was one of the regional Horizon Award winners. Yeah, it's, it's great. Becky, Planning Commission. Okay, so first question, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So the City Planning Commission actually didn't meet this month, so I don't have an update from them, but I did hear that the City Commission, which is a separate body, uh, they met, and there is talk of... Uh, at the south end of the Nottingham property, uh, we're looking at a facility that will have bowling, laser tag, axe throwing, and mini golf. So I'm excited about that. <laughs> That's all I have. <laughs> Next board retreat there. <laughs> and they did find uh, it. That's so exactly that's where my head went with that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Joe, curriculum. Did not meet. Did not meet. Okay, very good. With that, we'll move to new business. Uh, board policy updates. Yeah. Steve. annual board policy update uh, so you've got a series of policies here uh, if you were to look at these through a particular filter the very vast majority of these are all related to some modification made pertaining to the pandemic and how districts are operating and managing within the current pandemic so uh, you know if you talk about uh, evacuations and emergencies EBBD the first one uh, policy adds health or safety concerns to the list of reasons why school superintendent may announce a closing. Uh, communicable diseases, GAR, the next policy down, um, basically is, is updating that policy to reflect current law. Uh, also references the local health officer in terms of the uh, decision maker as far as who is contagious or no longer contagious and uh, helps set some guidance as far as uh, isolation and quarantine. Uh, JBE is an outdated policy that gets replaced by uh, the new uh, JBE. Uh, if a student decides that they want to drop out, there's a process that uh, the administration would sit down with the family and, and, and go through that that we're obligated to do with, uh, with them. And so that uh, form is an updated form. Uh, some of the statistics that they, the old form reference were, were fairly old. Uh, in terms of salaries associated with uh, uh, attaining certain levels of post high school you know, graduation and then and then beyond uh, JGCA is uh, is a title change uh, and and so we'll adopt the the title change uh, and and update the language within uh, but as Amy pointed out we've got new folks coming into the wellness committee and so we will be over the next couple of months working to update the wellness plan. Uh, and so you're not adopting or would not be adopting that plan in the February meeting. You're just updating the policy per se as far as that goes. But we'll bring that the wellness plan to you at a later date. GCC, communicable diseases, uh, adds a local health officer again in terms of uh, the list of individuals who uh, determine if a student has communicable diseases, uh, add some additional language uh, in terms of uh, readmitting students uh, from isolation or quarantine. Uh, and JHCAA is a, uh, an updated gang policy that uh, would come into play. So a little light reading. That's the Cliff's Notes version <laughs> of those. You have everything. Uh, barring something unforeseen, those would appear for uh, additional review and consideration in the February board meeting. So uh, I don't see anything in any of those policies, uh, with the exception of noting that the, the wellness plan would be coming at a later date, uh, would at this point be standing to recommend that those would be approved as presented. So, but not, not for tonight. So, any questions, comments? We'll move to uh, the next new business item on the agenda is the school calendar. All right, so we're going to label this the BC calendar uh, because um, it goes back to the before COVID look. Um, uh, you'll note that you know we started in September. We're ending towards the latter part of May this year. So this calendar um, 
really restores back to what previous year's calendars look like. It's a 182 contract day, unless you're a new student or new teacher, excuse me. And then it's a 185 day uh, contract by agreement. Um, I did meet with the teachers uh, group, the calendar committee this afternoon. Uh, had some good dialogue with them around uh, the calendar. One of the suggestions, if you note, uh, the start, uh, go look at the August dates. Um, historically, what would happen would be that uh, the 4th, 5th, and 6th of August would be those dates that would be set aside for new staff. So that's where those three, three days would come into play, the difference there. So we would bring new staff in. That's when we do uh, onboarding and orientation. Ron's got part of that. There's a community tour uh, and, and so on and so forth. So in this, in this calendar, you can see that uh, uh, we would have some flexibility to leave it at the 4th, 5th, and 6th. We could look at the 5th, 6th, and 9th. Um, uh, but, you know, there, there's some, some flexibility as, as it relates there. One of the adjustments that uh, was suggested today uh, by the calendar committee might be to move the, the start, uh, the first day, or what would be convocation, to the 9th of August. Uh, and so if you do that, then uh, you would probably be looking at pulling uh, in December, if you look down uh, the 22nd, seconds a teacher work day, you'd probably pull that into the 21st uh, to m compensate for that move. The benefit that that adjustment makes is that the 13th of August is, is set aside as a half a day. Uh, it would give, uh, uh, kind of a, uh, the term that was used today was sort of a soft launch to the, to the start of the school year. Um, so we'd, we'd come back in the 9th, 10th, and 11th for uh, professional development, a work day, half day on the 12th, and the full day on the, on the 13th, and then send everybody home. Right now, um, it's, it's not set up that way, but we've got some latitude to be able to make that adjustment. You're not acting on this tonight. This is the first time that you've had a chance to look at it, so we're just... Uh, taking a look at that uh, together. One of the other pieces I would note, um, and I, 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 I could not find it today, um, but the uh, Kansas Board of Regents and Kansas Department of Education are trying to, uh, in 22, 3, and 4, set a collective aligned spring break. Uh, it's not mandated that you do that, but that's the attempt that they are trying to make. I believe that I have it set correctly, uh, but that may be something that is adjusted depending on, again, the, the obviously the preference of the board, but then if I'm off a week, uh, plus or minus, uh, then that, that might be something also that we take a look at. So, uh, thoughts, questions? And I apologize, I'm trying to read the fine print here. The inclement weather days, how many do we have built in? You have two that are designated. Okay. Uh, those would stay in play. That was one of the questions that came up today. Uh, do we have those? Yes, we need to make sure that we have those uh, put in as part of our, our calendar. I would suspect that any latitude with regards to the 1116 hours that were required for a full school year uh, would terminate probably at the end of this calendar year if things progress in the manner that they, uh, I think everybody hopes as far as the vaccine and, and the impact on the, on the pandemic, so. Yeah. All right, very good. So take a five minute break before we go into exec session. Do you need a motion to go into executive or not until we come back? Okay.
you always click the right buttons. Somebody's going to go here yet. So we're back in open session and we have two final actions that we need to take. So is there a motion for? Uh, I, yeah, I move that we approve the early graduation request for student 2101 as presented. Is there a second? So Joe with the motion, Samantha with the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. And I move that we approve resolution 2102, extended leave as presented. Joe with the motion. Second. Samantha with the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Meeting's adjourned.